welcome, everybody. Um, my name's Eleanor Wilson. Um, I'm the uh, moderator for this panel. Yikes, I'm a teacher. Thank you guys all for being here. I am going to introduce our panelists uh, for Yikes, I'm a Teacher. Um, so firstly, um, we have Jeff Hubner. That's right. Um, Jeff Hubner is originally from Wisconsin. Um, he now teaches in Atlantic Beach, Florida, and he's been he's in his fourth year there as a teacher, um, but he's been teaching for 14 years altogether. Um, he's also an artist. He works in translucent porcelain pottery. Um, and you color your porcelain, no? Yes. Yes, colored porcelain. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, mostly functional work, functional yes, related work. Absolutely. Um, after earning a BFA from University of Wisconsin, he um, did a long-term residency at the Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts, and he established his own studio in 2009. Um, secondly, we have Kathy Skaggs. Right. Kathy Skaggs lives in Mayport, Florida, um, where she's a studio potter, and she works with Amico Classroom. Uh, helping teachers integrate clay into their curriculum, which I think is much, much needed these days. So that's amazing work. Um, she spent over 30 years teaching in K-12 art and has a master's in art education from Rhode Island School of Design and a master's in fine arts from the University of Florida. Um, you worked with Sarah Truman, no? Or do you know her? No? Okay. We have an article in the current issue from Sarah Truman, and she um, she worked with Amico, so I wasn't sure whether she worked with you or not. But um, it was the it was how Amico is helping to integrate clay into the classroom, similar stuff. Um, lastly, Bob Kirk. We have Bob Kirk here. He's a ceramic artist from Atlantic Beach, Florida, and he co-founded Atlantic Beach Pottery and is lead ceramics instructor at Episcopal School of Jacksonville. Um, he's in his fourth year there and has actually been a teacher for 26 years um, in public schools. Um, so he has a studio at home uh, where he experiments with materials and firing techniques um, and he has a BFA from the University of North Florida. So um, welcome to our panelists. Um, I think, yeah, thank, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to just like do the math in my head real quick. This combined, oh, like, geez. how many years of experience you have combined? It's like, oh. yeah, it's around 140. Yeah, it's 25 and 15, which would be 40, and then it was somebody, and then who's the <laughs> last person? And then 30 from you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, <laughs> that's over. <laughs> I started at 12. A wealth of experience here. So. Um, just maybe so our panelists can get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, how many people are students education majors or students studying education? Oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah, good. How many people are teachers now? Wow, Great. all right. Um, how many people are neither of those things? <laughs> all right, there you go. So, um, you know, that can give you a sense about half students, half educators, and a few people who might be aspiring or looking for a job, maybe you're looking for a job. I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so without further ado, I think we should go ahead and um, get started on the presentations. Um, and Jeff, I think you're first? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. Really appreciate everybody coming out today. My name is Jeff Hubner, and I'm a high school pottery teacher in Florida. My whole life I've been an extreme introvert, and I've always found comfort and quiet in the beauty of nature. I've also always loved adventure. My dream when I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stout in Menominee, Wisconsin, was to live on a large country property, fire a wood kiln, and make my living making pottery. Clearly that's not how it worked out. It was on one of my quests for adventure in nature that solidified my future as a teacher in an urban environment. In 2004, on a through hike of the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine, I was astounded by the kindness and generosity from people I met along the way. 
Naturally, on such a long hike, you have a lot of time for introspection. All right, go ahead, a couple here. I love these kids. <laughs> um, and I began to question, what was I doing to help out society as a whole? What was I doing to make the world a better place? I decided I wanted to put my passion for pottery to work for the good of other people, just like people have helped me along the way along my journey on the Appalachian Trail. It was this introspection that solidified my future as an art teacher in a big city. I thought teaching would be a great way to share my passion for pottery. I naively thought, since I knew so much about ceramics, it would be easy for me to inspire kids and teach them about pottery. I have never been more wrong about anything in my entire life. I just thank goodness I love adventure. It was, whew, it was a rough ride there for a little bit. Expectation versus reality, part one. Before I started teaching, I had this expectation in my head on how it all work out. I envisioned all the kids gathering around for the demonstration, all eagerly waiting to learn and figure it all out. That is not how it worked. Um, my first day, I was so, exci so excited. I dove in and decided we would paint today. Kindergartners were my first class. <laughs> I passed, this is my first day. I passed out all that paint. And they didn't know me or anything. I passed out the paint and I explained what we were going to do. And they painted. They painted everything. They painted themselves. They painted the tables. And they painted everywhere. And some of them actually got paint on the paper. It was at this moment that I realized I had no idea what I was doing. And just because I knew something about art, and it did not mean I knew anything about being a teacher. And here's where the real adventure began. I went home that night so frightened about what was to come the next day. What did I get myself into? Yikes, I'm a teacher and I have no idea what I'm doing. I knew I had to do something, so I treated it just like my artwork. I have since found that our creativity and problem solving skills translate to our progress in improving our teaching skills. I had a problem I didn't know how to teach, so I brainstormed ideas just like I would with my artwork. I thought of things I would do differently next time. I tried them and every day I would go home and evaluate and improve. What worked? What didn't work? Thankfully, I eventually improved and I feel like I've become quite good at teaching and inspiring students. During this time of reflection, I thought back to my experience in school. What made me want to go into the ceramics field? I have to thank the Wisconsin Public Schools and my pottery teacher for inspiring me. I remember being so self-conscious my first day of high school. It's a new environment, new people, new teachers, and everything was new, and frankly scary for this introvert. I was so worried about being judged that I had a hard time enjoying art, but my instructors were amazing and built a personal connection and confidence in me. This has become the hallmark of my teaching philosophy. Build confidence. When students are confident and comfortable in their surroundings, they thrive. My confidence building strategy is to start off the year doodling. Really, it's really informal. We just enjoy the materials and doing whatever comes to mind. I've done this from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade at the beginning of the year. We sketch several doodles, just drawing whatever comes to mind, whether it be lines, shapes, color, or really anything. I stress just enjoyment of the process. I do have one rule, though. You can't draw anything recognizable, such as a sailboat, a person, or a palm tree. We focus on being comfortable in the classroom with each other in a judgment-free zone. I have found that when students draw abstractly, they do not compare the validity of their artwork to others. The focus is on enjoyment of the process and being comfortable. Once students become comfortable in the room, we begin to take these drawings and edit them using the creative process. What works good in the drawing? What do we want to do more of? What do we want to take out? This editing process makes simple circles Squares, triangles, and even squiggles look like amazing pieces of art. This early success boosts students' confidence and makes them hungry to create more. When students feel comfortable, um, when students feel comfortable in their environment, they begin to thrive. And uh, this has been the key to my success: boost their confidence and make them want to be there. Once we have gone through this editing process, we publish a final drawing, and we focus on our craftsmanship and taking pride in the artwork. Students see how amazing they really are, even if all they drew was a square or a line. This, again, boosting their confidence. 
We then transfer those drawings onto a piece of ceramic art, in this case a plate. The transformation from doodle to a beautiful functional artwork is amazing. In just a couple days, students transition from being scared in a completely new place to mastering the techniques and creating an amazing product. Check out some of the artwork. These are all the plates that they made from those doodles. I just, they really have a good time making it. It's a really fun project to do. And they can, these are all ninth graders. I began teaching elementary students. I taught elementary for five years and moved on to middle school. I taught middle school for six years and now I teach high school. When I began teaching at my high school, there was a drawer full of texture pads. You know the kind that you put on a slab and it makes it look like wood grain, fish scales, or something like that? We made mugs using these texture mats and the students loved how realistic the texture looked. But I found it interestingly enough that these, this easy way to create realism actually eroded the confidence we had worked on so hard to gain. <laughs> students became self-conscious when creating other designs. They did not look as real as the texture mats and they were disappointed. Thankfully, in the same drawer, I found this texture roller, <clears throat> and I knew exactly where it came from and who had made it. It was this PVC-covered piece uh, with foam. This texture roll was made by one of the students of Kathy Skaggs, who we're so lucky to have here today. Kathy and Bob have been just such amazing mentors to me. I'm so thankful for them. This little texture roller has completely changed how I teach ceramics. This roller represents the clay version of our confidence building doodles. Since I have found this roller, I have completely eliminated all the machine made texture and decorating tools in the classroom and have replaced them with student created versions. When students create or begin creating their own texture from things they build or find from the start, they have an amazing amount of confidence in what they do. They are not comparing their works to those of the machine. Now when we make mugs, we make our own stamps and there's this great beauty that comes from seeing these stamps pressed into the clay and making the glaze break again, boosting their confidence. Making them love what they made and sharing the joy of handmade pottery. I really don't think it gets any better than this. When you, when you have these students making these stamps and pushing them into the clay and they see how the glaze breaks on there, it's just one of the best things ever. These are some of the ninth grader mugs from Pottery One class. Two pound, throw down. Once students get to that advanced level and they be, have become comfortable in the room in their environment and they begin making amazing strides, we all know how much they love a good challenge, teenagers these days. My challenge to everyone is called the two pound throw down. It is inspired by my high school football team's challenge called the half ton club. For the half ton club, you had to lift one half ton of weight or a thousand pounds in three lifts. When you did that, you got your name on a board just like this, and you got a t-shirt. And it was such a sense of pride to get that t-shirt and get your name on the board. So I've done the same thing in the pottery. This is the pottery version. Students create a two pound cylinder using two pounds of clay, and they try to get it at least three inches tall and seven inches, um, I'm sorry, three inches wide and seven inches tall. And when they do that, they get their name on their board. And in the future, I plan to put the records from each year on that. And here's one of the contestants there. Nine inches out of two pounds of BMX. That's pretty awesome. The challenge has, be, um, challenge has been great getting students to push their limits. Think about the first time you were able to like really throw that tall cylinder on the wheel and how much of a great sense of, you know, it's such a great feeling. Relevance. <laughs> what do we make and why do we make it? I think this question we've all asked ourselves at this point. Using the pots in the classroom makes the artwork relevant. When we make functional pots, items such as a mug, bowl, or cup, or plate, I always have a kiln unloading party. We have food and drink, and the students get to enjoy all their creations using them in the classroom, and this really makes it relevant for them. Expectation versus reality, part two. When I first started teaching, I expected there to be about 15 to 20 kids in, a cl in the classroom, just like there was when I was in school. The reality was 30 my first year, and then 40 after budget cuts. A year later, my principal came and said, your classes are going to be a little bit bigger next year. 
Here's what 65 kids looks like in a class. Yes, 65. Good thing I like adventure. At first, it was a little bit scary, and I was angry that they would put 65 kids in a class. And when they move, <laughs> it's, it really did seem unfair. I was, I was, it seemed really unfair. But then it dawned on me, if you don't take on this challenge and you don't figure out how to make this work, these kids are not going to have art in their lives. So I really took it onto that challenge. Challenge accepted. I'm going to figure out how to do this and make it work. I had to adapt and find a way to do it. Thankfully, those huge classes have come down in numbers after a few years. I took on the challenge to figure out how to, make, um, how to teach so many kids in one class. How do you manage materials? How do you do a demonstration? Can you imagine for a second all these kids gathered around a demonstration table trying to watch a demonstration? There's no way. Here's a few things I've learned in case you find yourself with a large class. Organization. I was inspired one night by an Amazon documentary on TV. At Amazon, they organize the warehouse randomly. Items are scattered all over the warehouse, so employees are never far from an item when pulling an order. This minimizes movement. I have done the same thing with the student work storage, and the, the students store their work in these little tubs. Instead of organizing storage by grade, period, or skill level, I have them color-coded. Students keep their artwork near their seat to minimize movement. When large amounts of students move, at one time, chaos ensues no more. Glazes are easily organized and labeled clearly with an example above them. I have three jars of each glaze, so it's very easy for me to tell which glazes are out and if something's missing. Um, finally, I feel like my biggest success so far has been with video instruction. Try to imagine that large group of people that we looked at earlier all gathered around a table. It just doesn't work. So furthermore, students are frequently absent. And those of you that had your hands raised as teachers um, earlier, you know they're frequently absent um, just due to testing, sports activities, makeup in other classes, illnesses, or for whatever reason. And it would be impossible to do a live demonstration for all the students that missed a class. Video allows you to replay the demonstration at any time, any place, any speed, and can be looped over and over while the students are working. Frequently, students watch the videos the day before the lesson and come into class already know what's going on. Video also allows for the perfect demonstration. I set up the cameras to show the perfect view of the area I want to showcase. There's no fumbling around for tools, and pauses can be edited out. When you have a large class, this allows for everyone in the room to see the screen. Here's some of the uh, images. So the students can really see what's going on. You know, if you try to imagine a you know, group seeing a, you know, a, a demonstration table and being far away, that would be difficult. But this allows them to see up close exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, and this is how my YouTube channel is set up. So each project has um, several videos. Um, and and you'll see right here that um, there's an overview. And the overview is about five minutes for the project. And it shows the entire length of the project in the overview. And then there's a lesson for each day. There's a video for each lesson so the students can go back and watch this. And I post it online so they can see what they missed. And it really helps out. All right. And I'm really so fortunate to have this huge TV in my classroom. I don't know what I would do without it. And it is touch screen. And uh, so I'm really thankful I have that. Um, and it allows the students, you can see up here it says loop. So it allows us, I keep it on loop while the students are working. And it allows the students to go up there and rewind, look at the steps they need to. And I really don't think it's necessary for you to have one of these in your classroom, the TV. You could do it on any kind of TV, projector, screen, student tablets, or even phones. Fortunately, um, there are several other teachers nationwide creating videos. So if you're just getting started or you do not have the time, there's plenty of high quality content available on YouTube and other sites. Okay, and you can see the students here, they're looking at the video. And because this is a touch screen, she's manipulating the, the, um, the, the search bar in there so she can go back and see the part that she needs to see. Okay. And I, last thing I want to share with you guys is I want to share this amazing art um, app called Artsonia. 
Artsonia is a digital portfolio. Artsonia allows you to create a portfolio for your students throughout your art program. The cool thing about this app is it stays with the student for all their art classes. A student may be in your pottery class and also taking a drawing class. Both teachers and student can add art to the portfolio. These portfolios accumulate each year. By the time students are seniors, they'll have a record of all four years. This makes it easy to apply for juried shows, colleges, AP classes, and so on. The portfolio is also automatically shared with the parents so they can see what their child is doing at school. It's an amazing app and I can't recommend it enough. I want to thank you again for coming today. Hopefully this helped you, uh, you know, helped you out a little bit and we'll be looking forward to your questions after the rest of the panel. I'd like to welcome up Kathy Skaggs, the amazing Kathy Skaggs. Oh, oh, oh I that. forgot to show yeah. some of the student artwork. Do it. Here's some of the student artwork, just a couple slides. Yeah, the chicken. There we go. Good job, Jeff. Hi. My name is Kathy Skaggs, and I'm glad to be part of this group talking about teaching the ceramic arts in the public school, in the public classroom. I do have to tell you that I did, when I graduated from UF as an undergrad, I quit after my first year of teaching. I went into that classroom and I taught for the year, but I said, who in the world wants this job? It was so difficult, discipline issues, you had a lot of paperwork to do, you had this really fast pace that you had to get used to, and it was tricky, and I just bowed out. And then I stayed away from education for a couple of years, and then I went back into it with a different attitude. I said, maybe it's not those kids. Maybe it's the way I'm communicating. Maybe I'm not presenting the information in the correct way, and maybe I don't have it organized in the correct way. Initially, when I first started teaching, I, want, I didn't want to limit anybody's creativity. I said, I forgot to turn on my slides, um, I didn't want to limit anyone's creativity. I wanted students to be totally free to express themselves any way that they wanted to. After a while, I noticed I was getting the same kind of images. I was getting a lot of M&M &M birds, and I was getting a lot of things like uh, hearts, and these same images over and over again. I thought, what in the heck is going on? Where, why are these kids constantly giving me these trite symbols. Students often fall back on things that have always worked in the past. And I do have to tell you as I'm speaking, this is some student work from before I retired in 2015. This was student work from my high school, from kids in my class. So it works like this, Johnny. Johnny is the best artist in his elementary classroom. Johnny is known as the artist. And when anybody asks in the classroom, they all say, oh, have Johnny draw it. He's the artist. So Johnny gets out of elementary school. Johnny goes to middle school or high school, where he meets a teacher that asks him to solve visual problems. What does he do? Johnny totally panics. Here he's had all this artistic fame through elementary school. And what does Johnny do? Johnny totally shuts down. You have to keep students engaged by challenging them or they will never progress and they revert back to those old images that have worked in the past. Artistically gifted students and strong visual learners can easily drown in a sea of indecision. It's not that they lack for ideas, it's that they generate too many. So I decided I was gonna tighten up the parameters. Instead of giving them more options, I was gonna give them less, and I was gonna see how tight I could squeeze this and still make it work. And this is how it worked. 
Instead of saying, today, you're going to make a block print, and you can make whatever image you want. Instead of that, I would say to them, <clears throat> today, we're going to brainstorm some images, and, but it's got to be all about triangles. You have to use at least 20, however many you want past that. You can intersect them. You can be small, large, overlapping, however you want to generate it. But it can only be triangles. So what happened is, you know, when you tell someone that, that is used to generating a lot of images, I bet already in your head you're like, what would I do with those triangles? And you realize that, the, and I realized that the results I got were absolutely incredible. The work was much more diverse instead of being similar. Because with kids that are artistically gifted or visually very, or good experts at learning visually, they take in a lot. And when you can get rid of a lot and have them narrow that margin, ironically, their work becomes more creative instead of less creative. When I gave students assignment, I looked around the room, and they were all sitting back in their seats, and they're like really working hard to think about an image. They're sketching. They want to come up with an image that is going to be a powerhouse, that's going to make them look great, that's going to get them a great grade. Their hearts are in the right place. But what happens is, they can never execute the idea that's in their head. And they're constantly disappointed. They have missed all those gems along the way of ideas that they could have really worked on. And, but instead, they're just kind of hell or high water about that final image. So I think it's important to encourage those obstacles to break them out of that. Yes, they can come with a basic idea, but they have to stay flexible throughout the making. Something that I would call dialogue with the piece. I heard this quote that I absolutely love the other day. It says, success is enthusiastically moving from one mistake to the next. With my beginning pottery students, I, knew that I noticed that they were thinking kind of along two lines. They were thinking about number one, the concept and the idea of what they were going to build, and number two, how were they going to construct it? I decided I was going to give their brains a rest. You know, you'd think I was like doing all these experiments with my classes, and I was. Um, I was going to give their brain a rest. So I thought, I'm going to remove one of the two. And ironically, the one that I pulled away was the creative element. Why? Why would I do that? Because you can't stop it. You're never going to remove it. But I just wanted to pretend like I was pulling that away. For instance, I wanted them to make a figure sculpture. I would never tell them initially, but they were going to do it. Instead, I'd start with pinch pots. Then I'd have them make double pinch pots. Then I'd say, OK, you have to make an abstract sculpture out of X amount of pinch pots. Then I would say, OK, now we're going to work on a figure with X amount of pinch pots or X amount of height. Give them a little few parameters. Once the technical training is done, I up the ante into the sculptural project. And I'd say something like, we're going to build this sculptural project. Now, now that their mental muscles were trained, they were free to move into more complex ideas because now they could switch off the construction concerns and completely concentrate on the concept. It's what I call leapfrog learning. It's alternating between skill and concept. You teach a skill, you back it up with a concept. You teach a new skill, you back it up with a concept. And once their mental muscles were trained, they could easily move into more conceptual pieces, similar to the way that an athlete would train for a game. Now, that being said, on any project, if a student came up to me and they said, Miss Skaggs, I was thinking about this in math, or Miss Skaggs, I was thinking about this the night before when I was going to sleep, no matter what they told me, no matter how much I doubted it would ever work, I backed up and I said, do it. 
because you never interfere at that point because they've already, the wheels are in motion. <clears throat> Even if I thought it wasn't going to work, I let it go. I believe in a very structured pottery curriculum, something I called in my classroom art boot camp. It levels the playing field so all students can feel successful instead of only a chosen few. If only a few students are successful, the others shut down because they think they will never be as artistic. It sets a, up a terrible dynamic. The successful, talented ones then stop working because they don't want to take any more risk because they're already looking good. When all students are successful, they all stay engaged, which creates a positive and nurturing environment. Once they are all a success, they gain the confidence and they are more willing to take risk. Once they're all successful and cozy in the nest and you've just got them right there, then you start to systematically kick them out of the nest by giving them some more problem solving assignments. An example would be a slab pot. For beginners, I had them all make a slab pot with 90 degree angles and a lid. They looked pretty generic when they got done and very similar. So I'd always back it up with something, say a sculpture on the top and or the side, so that they would all look a little more individual. Once they had command of that construction skill, then I would say, okay, now you're gonna make a slab pot of your own design with at least five to seven sides with no 90 degree angles. As I worked on projects with beginners in large classes, I think it's best to keep them all together to help solve common technical issues. But some students, you'll have those runaway kids that are very gifted and technically have a lot of expertise and they just go like wildfire through those projects. You need to throw lots of obstacles in their way because you want them to stay challenged and you want them to kind of stay so you can kind of carry this momentum along. So when I did slab pots, I'd say, build another slab pot on top. Make a box in a box. Make multiple openings, whatever I could think of. Make a, a drawer in a slab box. Something that would throw an obstacle in their way that would keep them challenged and keep them moving along. For the last 10 years, I never did a demonstration in class. Instead, I would duct tape a tripod to the side of my table and I'd put a camera, later an iPhone, and I'd do step-by-step -step movies of what I was teaching in class. Similar to what Jeff is doing, it is invaluable. Some teachers would ask me, how did you find time to do it? Well, I did it the planning period before I taught whatever it is I was teaching. I mean, they were a little crude, but they did work. I never added audio because I wanted to talk the students through the process and I only gave them a daily goal. And once they could stay with me through those daily goals, I knew I would add, it would add up and end up well. I was shocked at how well it worked. I realized when students sometimes watch one continuous video, when they get to the end, they forgot the first step. The beauty of this is I started putting little videos in a keynote or a PowerPoint that would be step by step. And what happened is it broke all those steps without them knowing it, without you telling them, it broke those into steps in their head instead of being one continuous video. Now I'm lucky enough, I'm retired, and I spend part of my time in my studio in Mayport, Florida. And I'm lucky enough to be partnered with Amico, where we've been working on an online curriculum called Amico Classroom. If you're already experienced in teaching clay, the documentation alone will give you the paper trail you need in your classroom. There is nothing better than on observation day than to have a well-organized notebook with everything on there or when you go to a parent conference. The beauty of the material is you can download it and uh, you can alter it because none of us teach the same. I mean, you're going to teach different than I would, so you kind of have to just go in there and look around. So there's lots of forms that you can use. This is a historical reference sheet, but there is a ton of stuff in there. This is for what I call the boot camp, pinch, coil, and slab. 
There's all kinds of information on each one. And for each one, there are the step-by-step -step videos similar to what I used in my classroom, but mine were not this fabulous, but Amico made them fabulous. So there are step-by-step -step videos for you to show your students. Now, you're savvy enough probably in Clay. You don't need any of the notes, but there are notes that I write, especially for teachers that want to teach Clay but don't know anything about Clay. It'll be notes of me whispering in, in their ear, watch out for this don't do this, this will come back and haunt you. You can go in there and edit it any way you want, drop slides out, use only what you want. There's also some other information, this is stages of clay, I used to use this when I first introduced clay, and it goes over wet work, leather hard, bone dry bisque, it's a great introduction when you very first start off clay, but there's a lot of others, like how to recycle in the classroom, you're, you're not gonna have a slip bucket always like you did in grad school or undergrad school. It's the hardest way to recycle clay in a classroom. So there's information about that. There is a great kiln, one that they just launched. It's uh, fabulous. So this is what you do. You go home, you get on your computer, you get a cup of coffee or a cold drink of your choice, and you sit in there and you start hunting. It's all free. It's all downloadable, and it's all, you can just change it any way. But I'm telling you what, you're going to be looking so good when you have all this in your classroom. So I want to thank you for being here today. And here's Bob Kirk. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Kirk. I teach at a medium-sized private school uh, in Jacksonville, right outside of, we all live together in the same uh, neighborhood. Um, I've taught for 26 years now, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I almost quit my first year about halfway through, and uh, I don't know if Kathy bailed me out or <laughs> somebody did, but here I go. I will not go into all the details, but I spent four years in business school and a year in the corporate world before I headed off to art school. I was employed as a middle school art teacher a few days after graduation. Luckily, and this is what saved me, luckily I was the only teacher at a brand new school. I thought I was prepared. After all, I was pretty successful in my studio um, classes in college. Um, that was laughable. Thankfully, there were no other traditions in the school that my program would be compared to, and there were no other art teachers looking over my shoulder. I was the only art teacher at a brand new spanking school. It was great. It's the only reason I stayed in teaching. If anybody would have been there, I would have run. Uh, needless to say, I was able to celebrate my successes publicly and quietly um, hide all the disasters. Eventually, I moved on to schools with much bigger art departments and was able to fine tune the craft of teaching adolescents with a host of fantastic mentors. All right, ceramics is my best class ever. That is what you want to hear from your students. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about and show and share with you are some things that I have found after 26 years to help me help these kids find that place at school. Um, here's some slides of really happy kids who come to the um, art room all day. Every time there's a free period, there's people in there working. And, that, and it's hard to do at a school, and some of the tips I'm going to share with you are going to be help to get the rest of the school on board with these students spending that time. And uh, we'll get that to, it, to that in a minute. Here we go. Happy kids. Super happy kids. Um, these are the ultimate goals. We want these students to be able to communicate relevant ideas with their artwork. We want them to develop a personal aesthetic. We want to develop an intuitive sense of design. We want to be able to harness the potential that comes from a strong work ethic. For some, to have the desire to pursue fields in the arts and basically to help these adolescents become better people.
students building community. Building community outside of the classroom is one thing, but equally important is building an awareness within the school of what your program entails and its value for the school and the students. Growing a dynamic program is much more likely to happen if there is support of the administration, your fellow teachers, the students' parents, college counselors, the coaches, and non-art students, or maybe art students from other disciplines. This is an example of this image is uh, an event that I've been doing the last two or three years It's called Art of Arts. And we invite all the parents, administrators, um, coaches, guidance counselors, college counselors, everybody we can think of to come to this event especially the parents. They need to know where their child spends four years of their high school experience. Um, so having them come in and we work with them and the students work with them, they show them the, the space, they show them how, how they use the space, they give them tours of the kiln yard, um, they let everybody know. Here's a picture of one of my students working with her sibling. Here's an image of one of my AP students working with her father. This is one of my AP students working with the crew coach. And I think you have to understand, especially if you haven't been in a classroom, you have to work with all these people all the time. I have to make sure that I can talk to the college counselors and make sure they don't recommend that students don't take ceramics. Um, the parents have to be on board. If a student is gonna pay uh, or spend four, four years of their life in high school in the ceramics room, the parents need to know what goes on there and how things work. Um, if you've ever taught, the coaches definitely are in competition with you after school. If you have a, a, a student that's on the crew team, you have to respect how hard it is for the crew coach to do his job if one of the um, people in the five-man boat is gone. It's a lot easier to work with all the players, the administrators, um, the coaches all, if they know what's going on in your room. So I'm really spending a lot of time the last few years making sure that these people come and see what's happening in the ceramics room. At the same night, the photo department and the, the uh, 2D design department, the uh, draw paint print teacher has all their parents and all their uh, community of people at the school participate. This has been one of the most valuable things that I've ever done in 26 years of teaching. Um, when you need money for a pug mill or you need money for something, it's a lot easier to go talk to the headmaster or the principal if he's been in your room and tried to throw a pot on the wheel. <coughs> Thanks for that water job. Okay, students creating ownership of their work and their place. And their place is their studio, the galleries, places like that. Um, Kathy and Jeff both talked about uh, creating ownership and making individual work that's inspiring and, and not something that seems so cookie cutter. Um, we also really, at, at my program, focus on making your own tools everywhere possible. So we make our own brushes. Um, we make our... Uh, own um, roller stamps. We make plenty of uh, ways to put imprint impressions on clay and when the kids um, focus on that, I think, like I said, we've already talked about it in the, in the panel, that is really creating ownership and the kid owns that design. Um, if you do some commercial printmaking and you have some of the commercial tools, it's great when the kid next to you is working really hard and then they, you look over and your surface is the same as the kid next to you. That's not what any kid wants. Um, so really spending the time to, um, to make that uh, happen. I invest a lot of time in making tools. I had a, a guest artist um, last year. He came and he used a rib to make a bowl with a surfboard fin. Well, all the kids all of a sudden wanted to do that, and I said, that is great, and they start bringing in all their materials. And um, uh, developing their own clay bodies and glazes. Um, 
it's not, you don't have to have an extensive glaze lab to make glazes. One of my favorite projects that I do with the students is I do the um, grocery store glaze. You send somebody to the grocery store to get a, a box of 20 mule team. It's a borax. It's in the soap department. And then you send them out to the baseball field to get a little clay off the pitcher's mound. And we mix that. And that's as simple as you, you can make a very simple glaze, and the kids love it. The kids that really get interested in it, they can go on past that and start making their own glazes. But that's a really good inspirational start where, hey, you need to make the grocery store glaze and try it. Um, you guys should try it too. It's really easy, and it costs like three dollars for the um, for the box of soap. And I'm sure you have red clay somewhere around you if you have a baseball or a softball field. Um, developing their own clay bodies. You can simplify that. To uh, it can all happen at the wedging table. You don't have to have a clay mixer. Um, if you have some red clay and some white clay, they can work on making different um, amounts of color and color changes in it. They can put grog in it. They can put sand in it. Um, we live near the beach. Go get some beach sand. That'll be really personal for you to have the sand from your yard and your clay. So making your own clay bodies doesn't have to have a recipe and a lot of equipment. Um, but if you do the art of the arts and by all your administrators and parents and other teachers, it's easier to get a lot of that other stuff. So not only um, going back to what I was talking about with the first slides of uh, the Art of the Arts and the events where we have all the, the um, community there, it helps to get that equipment that you might want and need. <coughs> um, curating their own show. Students should be curating their own shows and creating alternative exhibition opportunities. Um, here's some slides of our main gallery. It's in the lobby of our theater at our campus and it's beautiful and uh, I don't carry kids work to the galleries anymore. I'm like you want to have a show let's all go and we'll take it all together and we'll we'll meet up and um, but the kids have to have ownership of how we're going to display it. What's going to go together? How are you going to print your name tags out? Are you going to print an artist statement with it? Um, and this is our main gallery and we change it out really as often as the kids want to. When we feel it's time we do it. Um, we have another gallery space that we've, uh, we've put on campus, and it's the lobby of the library. I found two old cabinets from uh, the gym area where they used to put trophies outside of the, the gymnasium. And we said, well, let's bring these in, and let's get some lights from Home Depot. And uh, we can fit about 10 or 15 paintings in there, and I have a couple cases. Um, the kids love this. And they have the ability to curate one-person shows or group shows in this little um, lobby of the library. Here's another alternative display case. This is right outside of the ceramics room. And this is a little water house that we built. And we had a couple students that were re really interested in construction. They built the structure of it. And I had all the Pottery One kids jump in and build tiles for the roof. Well, we made this little hut. And the kids love to take the work out and put their own work in. And it might be just for a day. It might just be to take images and slides. Um, or they might leave it up for weeks. Uh, but this is another little space. I encourage everybody to find every way to display the kids' work um, that you possibly can and have them do all of it. Um, another uh, event that works really well that I've been doing in just the last few years is during the lunch hours, we have a small auditorium on campus, a little black box theater type room, a little smaller, half of this size probably. And um, the AP students schedule slide presentations in there once a month during lunch. The same thing goes. We invite the administrators. We invite their English teacher, their history teacher, their science teacher. We provide, some of the kids provide their own food and snacks. Um, they do groups of three. Sometimes it's not three ceramic kids. It might be a photo kid, a draw paint print kid, or a, um, or and a uh, photography kid. That gives these students an opportunity to invite all their friends at lunchtime to the mini theater and go through their slides and talk about their um, artist statement and basically show a senior, uh, what a senior AP concentration would look like. We do this throughout the whole year. It's mostly for seniors. We've had a few juniors do it, but again, the most important ingredient is getting the other teachers and the coaches and the faculty and the administration to come and participate and watch these kids. 
that's totally organized by the kids, and, and they decide when they're going to go and who they're going to go with. If you give them that ownership, and everybody else knows that there's a lot of student ownership going on in the program, it's only going to mean great things. It's going to make that college counselor not want to discourage somebody from taking a third or a fourth art class. Yes, ma'am. Okay. See what happens when I start talking? I start running out of time. All right, effective, effective layering to maximize opportunity. This is something I've been doing for the last three or four years also. If I would have done a speech 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 years ago, it would be totally different. This is all the like, latest things that I think are, are awesome. Um, almost all Pottery One classes, you start off with some type of pinch pot. Uh, form and Kathy and Jeff talked about these pinch pot forms. Uh, I have my students start off with a two-piece pinch pot and we talk about the anatomy of a vessel and they go through a process of making the, the two-piece pinch pot into the body of a pot and they have to add a foot and a neck and we look at Greek pots and it's very formal and they do handles and coils. Well in this first attempt I have them um, use coil method, the pinch pot method for the body. I make them roll a slab and make a slab neck and, and we go through a lot of those steps, and this project goes three or four weeks. Well, any of you that already teach high school, or if you're gonna, getting ready to teach high school, you know kids finish fast, and some kids finish slow, and I always have to have something in between for somebody to do, so there's not people sitting around. So what I've basically been doing lately, uh, and by that I mean the last two or three years, is I have the students that finish early, I'll stop everybody when it looks like people are finishing, and, I, and we make just pinch pots and we pinch the rims thinner and we leave a lot of clay in the foot and I take them all over to the pottery wheel and I say, hey, now you guys are gonna learn how to trim feet on bowls. So they make pinch pots and trim feet. And um, you can see here's one I particularly like. You can really tell it's got a trim foot. It might not be totally unified, but I think it's great. Um, that these kids start making pinch pots and then trimming, and they learn how to center on the wheel. And while they're doing that, just like when you're throwing um, pots on the wheel for your first time, your first bowl project, you have to make every mistake to be good at anything. So these kids have these pinch pots that they make pretty quickly, and they don't have a lot invested in them. There's no grade, there's no pressure. I'm not asking them to turn them in. And they grind through these pinch pots and they start trimming them. And they get better and better and better at trimming them before they've ever thrown a pot on the wheel. Um, we also look at a lot of Chino and Aribe tea bowls while I'm uh, doing this. This kind of the side project while everybody's finishing their formal grade that gets all the big points. Um, so we get these pinch pots that look like this, and I love this. I wish I would have trimmed this foot. This is some kid. He didn't even realize how awesome it was. Um, but what happens is when they... Um, go to throw on the wheel in January, they've been through this extra time throughout the first semester and they really get good at trimming feet and they make a, a bowl or two and when they finally get a good one, they do not have to even think about it. They know how to trim already. Um, it's hard if you're throwing and struggling with all the first steps of making a bowl and then you have to tr learn the whole trimming thing and you gotta go through one, you gotta make the foot over here, you gotta go through all these things before you get it right. They already know how to do it and it really makes that bowl unit and they're throwing better than I've ever seen. Um, all right, I know I'm running out of time. I'm going to show lots of example pots. Kids that are making cups should have every friend you know that makes pots should give you some of their bisqueware to put out so the kids can hold them and pick up their work, and, and they will learn how to make pots better if they have these things. Now, everybody I've ever known, or when we have demonstrators come in, they always leave bisque projects for us. They don't sit up high on a shelf. We put them out when we're making whatever it is. Here's some teapots, and hopefully they turn into really nice teapots, like Evan here. And do I have any more time? Okay. Let me hit on one. I'm almost done. I'm gonna hit on one thing, then we'll go. Okay. Our school does a Harkness method of learning. And I don't know a lot about it, but it made my class, it's made my class and critiques unbelievably great. And here's a, this is a picture of a regular English class. All the English and history classes at my school, they sit around this table 
and they dialogue and they have a conversation. I'm going to read you a little piece here. Um, the Harkness Method style of teaching explores ideas as a group. It develops the courage to speak, the compassion to listen, and the empathy to understand. The Harkness Method is about collaboration and respect where every voice carries equal weight. Even when you don't agree, Harkness is a very Socratic, democratic method with minimal teacher intervention. Um, that's an Eng that's a, a history class, and this is what my critiques look like now. We don't put a person up in the front to tell about their work, and everybody's watching, and we put all the work out together, and we sit in a circle, and we have conversations about it. We can go back and forth, and uh, we'll we'll go back and uh, and make a comparison to another student's work, and. Um, it's been a really great experience. I haven't had nothing to do with the success. The school's adopted this. My kids love to critique. If you want to look up Harkness and like look more into that, Philip Exeter High School is uh, kind of the people who invented it back in the 30s. Thank you very much. Please ask questions. If you have any questions, we got just another minute or two. Thanks again. Thanks, you guys. Um, I was writing notes and had some questions, but I'm just going to open it up to you guys last few minutes. So if anybody has any questions for our panelists, um, yes. Yeah. OK, so the question is, what's the recommendation for um, someone who is trying to begin an art program at a school that hasn't existed before? My, my, suggestion, my suggestion would be to start it at lunchtime or in the morning or after school, find a space and start doing it, then get the administrators to come in and say, look, these kids are meeting every day, we really need to put this in the curriculum. But I would, do, I would just start doing it, and the sooner the better. And let everybody know you're doing it. Um, I, we have to take some other questions. Yeah, after. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go, go, One go thing that I want to say is, when I developed those videos and the, the keynotes and PowerPoints, I got huge kudos. I mean, my, my uh, evaluations went through the roof. And mm -hmm. my administrators were so impressed because, like Jeff, we've put our own together. You know, we did it in our classroom. I mean, I've worked with Amico to try to put it out there for everybody. But for me, it, it was my administrators went berserk over it. I think we have time for one more question. I'm sorry. So, go ahead. Do you have any advice for first year teachers? Advice for first year teachers. <laughs> just love what you're doing <laughs> and just keep at it, and it's going to get better and more fun every day. And just celebrate the student's success, and it's just going to work out good for you. So, that's all the time we have. Thank you guys so much. You can